I'll start by introducing our first speaker, who many of you will know, um, Dr. Peter Prinsloo, who um, is um, the consultant chemical pathologist at the Nottingham, or City Hospital Nottingham. Um, so Nottingham, we're very happy to host the Awareness Day today. Nottingham, as, again, as many of you will be aware, has Paget's Association Centre of Excellence, and unusually, uh, that reflects both the quality and, and of our clinical care service here in Nottingham that Peter heads up, and also the basic research um, that we perform here in Nottingham into disease mechanisms in Paget's disease. And so you'll hear in this session about both of these. Th thank you for, um, for the invite to come and speak here. Um, it's um, notable that I always get the sort of the afternoon slumber slot um, when the food sort of starts making the way to the brain and people start getting um, nice and snoozy. So those of you who um, fall over, just let them lie and um, don't, um, don't interfe interfere with anybody sleeping. So I'll talk about um, making some sense of treatment because um, we've had some guidelines published on how to treat Paget's disease and we'll try our best to make some sense of how to treat Paget's disease. And I've started with um, an x-ray of Paget's disease and we see there's, I hope you can see it in the back, but this is a pagetic tibia and there's a small little insufficiency fracture. And this is sometimes how we see patients present with pain over the tibia, with uh, little lesions, um, sometimes fractures. And the difficulty is then to decide how to treat it. And, and we don't have very clear guidelines. We've had some, some um, guidelines from the Endocrine Society and also from the uh, Pagets Association. But when it comes to evidence, and, and lots of guidelines are evidence-based, the Pagets Association guidelines is, is evidence-based, it doesn't quite clearly give us an indication of how to treat. And, and I've quickly sort of tallied up the, the years of experience in the room and there's centuries of experience of Paget's disease from patients and of um, medics in, in the room and scientists, but, but we've not been able to put that into practice due to the fact that we don't have enough evidence. And I'm going to try and make some sense with treatment. Um, and I'll start with some quotes from, um, he's, not, um, he's not the uh, Paget's Association speaks person, but there was a well-known president that had a quote something like that that says we know what we know and we know what we don't know but we don't know what we may not know um, and that's sometimes how you feel with Paget's disease. The second quote is that one for myself. I have many opinions and I'm sometimes I have some strong opinions and sometimes I disagree with myself as well so and that's sometimes you look at a disease and you try to treat it and then when you revisit it two weeks later you might think well actually that might not be the right way to treat it so so we are confused at times with what would be the best because the evidence is not there uh, and then lastly I've put up there fools rush in and I think that's with Paget's disease quite a useful um, sort of note and memory to hold is that we don't want to rush into treatment if we might cause more harm than good um, so these are the um, uh, guidelines that um, Dr. Divya Teja has spoken about earlier and I've put that up and I don't expect you to read it but this is the guidelines on treatment so it's a summary of guidelines on treatment it was in the Paget's newsletter and it's out on the website and every part of the guideline um, focuses on different areas of treatment. Now, what we're trying to achieve really is to improve quality of life. So we want to have patients to manage their pain. We want to improve um, uh, the quality of life. We want to prevent progression of degenerative changes or deformity. We want to reduce blood loss prior to surgery. And I'm glad to hear that the orthopedic surgeons um, in Sheffield agree with that because our local orthopedic surgeons are very keen that we reduce metabolic activity so we try to uh, prevent complications and then there's surgery and then pain management and I'm not going to talk much about pain management and I'm not going to say much about surgery but I'll just talk about the treatment modalities available to us so there's a, a, a few drugs we don't have a, a huge armamentarium of drugs. We have calcitonin, which is a drug that we used to use many years ago, but 
it did come with some bad press with some risk of cancer and so we don't use calcitonin much very often we use bisphosphonates which is the backbone of treatment um, and then there's some uh, drugs that's under investigation some of you may have come across denosumab which we use very commonly in patients with osteoporosis and um, we'll speak about what, um, where we can use denosumab and where we can't use denosumab for treatment of Paget's disease. Um, so I'll talk about calcitonin. So calcitonin is, a, is what we use, used many years ago more commonly as I've said and that was to control pain. If we know that it controls pain. There's good evidence that it controls pain. It decreases bone turnover, it decreases metabolic activity in the bone and then also um, it does have a downside that it does increase the risk of cancer if used in long term. So we can consider it for short term use if patients can't tolerate bisphosphonates but really it's short term use and it's not something that most of us use nowadays um, on a regular basis. The other drugs are the bisphosphonates. Now bisphosphonates is fascinating because we're very keen on evidence-based medicine, but bisphosphonates is literally if um, the physicians in the 60s and 70s didn't drop the baby in the washing water, then we wouldn't have used bisphosphonates. Because bisphosphonates started out as um, uh, in w a, a water softener, basically a water softener to in, in detergents. And, and it was... Um, used in detergents and there were some very clever men in Holland and in, in the UK that decided to look at bisphosphonates. So there was um, a gentleman, Olaf Bayfoot in, in Holland and Prof Hosken, I believe, worked with Olaf Bayfoot in, in Leiden. Um, and they looked at bisphosphonate and then in the UK, Graham Russell looked at bisphosphonate. So there was lots of papers published at the time. but. As you can see, there was very little evidence, so they took a detergent and say bisphosphonates might soften the water, so it binds onto calcium. Could it bind onto bone and could it be of effect for people who have bone disease? And it was used in the first instance in children that had very severe metabolic bone disease um, without any evidence. So uh, it's a bit like penicillin. The first person to use penicillin used it with no evidence when we talk about uh, viral uh, vaccinations, they use it without any evidence. So um, we try to work with evidence, but it, sometimes you have to say, well, we don't have the evidence and therefore we need to do what we know from experience and what we think is best um, in the best interest of patients after discussing it with, with patients. So um, if we then look at how to manage pain, and I'll base this on some case discussions. I'm presenting a patient um, that I've known for many years and when he first presented he was about 44 years old he presented with pain in his upper arm he um, used his arm in his trade so working he struggled quite severely pain was worse at night and he told me it felt as if his arm was being eaten at night um, so by gnawed on by rats um, he had pain on movement of the arm and the grinding in his shoulder and um, he said he'd been to physiotherapy without improvement, didn't have any x-ray or investigations, and he was referred to us because he had an x-ray done. He didn't have any biochemistry done, but that was his x-ray. So the x-ray showed that he had severe uh, Paget's disease of um, the humerus, and Paget's disease causes swelling and expansion of the bone, so the humerus was much thicker. If you examined him, you could feel that the humerus was much bigger on the, on the affected side. Um, and he also complained of a bit of back pain, so we did an x-ray of his spine and it showed that there was a, one of the vertebrae on the spine showed some enlargement and, and some um, swelling of the bone or enlargement of the tissue. Um, when we did a bone scan, it showed that he had quite severe activity and this is the quantitative bone scan, so we measure the activity. Um, and we send patients for these scans. If they glow in the dark when they come out of the scanner, then we know that there's Paget's disease. And you could see there's clearly activity there. The humerus activity on this side was 10 times the humerus activity at the bottom that's printed at the bottom there. So it's, um, and then we gave him treatment. So we discussed treatment options with him. At the time, 
We used um, intravenous pomidronate was one of the drugs that was more commonly used. It was, um, so we had a dose of intravenous pomidronate at the time and it responded really well. So you could see the activity decreased to 2.3 to 1 and he was pain free. So he was virtually pain free after one dose of pomidronate. And that was his, um, oh sorry, he, he, he was given zoledronate. I was thinking another patient I was going to discuss. So he was given zoledronate at the time. We just started using zoledronate. And his alkaline phosphatase, so the blood test showed very good activity for this gentleman. And he did very well on that um, treatment. Biochemically, he did well for about a year. And then after that time, he came and he complained of further pain, but then on further investigation, his biochemistry stayed stable, but then it was the deformity. So then the pain was in his, in his shoulder. So I think it's important where we need to distinguish between pain of the joint, where the Paget's disease, because it caused expansion of the bone, caused him to develop pain in the shoulder, or whether it's Paget's disease that's in the bone that caused the pain. And that's where we don't have adequate evidence with regards to that the, if had we been able to treat him earlier whether we would have been able to prevent the osteoarthritis or the degenerative changes in his shoulder but we knew that we could reduce the pain in the in the arm so our aim is to improve quality of life to prevent fractures to pre prevent progression of osteoarthritis blood loss to surgery but if you go through the guidelines it's almost as, as if you want to lose heart because the, the guidelines and the evidence does not prove any of this. I think um, Stephen Tuck or my colleagues that, that work in the, in the um, uh, field of Paget's disease will all say, I know that if I give that patient treatment, the pain will get better or I might reduce the risk of a fracture or the orthopedic surgeons, even though there's very little evidence that it reduces blood loss. An orthopedic surgeon would be very reluctant to operate if the person's metabolic turnover of bone has not been uh, reduced by giving them treatment prior to, um, to the surgery. So if we look at the next gentleman, he's a 72-year-old gentleman that presented in 2008. So he presented with vague hip pain, um, especially at night, again, not associated with exercise. and that can be important in, in the diagnosis of osteoarthritis of the hip because if you have degenerative changes of the hip and you're very active then that might start pay, becoming more painful the more exercise you do especially if you do unusual exercise um, climbing out, out of golf bunkers or so that might put the more strain on the on the hip and cause problems um, he was treated with resedronate initially in, in another hospital and then he had some pain improvement but he had recurrence of pain after 18 months and he was referred to us at the Paget's clinic and that was his x-ray so he has extensive Paget's disease in the hemipelvis he does have degenerative changes in the right hip and that was what we discussed earlier so how do we know which one of those two is causing the pain it's very difficult to decide is that pain related to the fact that this hip joint is damaged compared to that hip joint, there's loss of joint space, there's calcifications, or is it related to the Paget's disease? If you do a, a bone scan, that was his bone scan, and the bone scan severe activity in the right hemipelvis compared to that pelvis, so you could see the severe activity, that's the bladder that, you, that shines, up, uh, shines up there, so, but the pelvis is very badly affected, um, so much so that you could hardly see what's going on in the head of the femur, but we know that Paget's disease is unusual to cross over bones, so in, in this case it's purely in the pelvis. Um, and then he's showed the activity on the, on, on the, on the scan, um, and he received a dose of intravenous zoledronate in, in June 2011. The pain improved, no analgesia required, his quality of life was excellent. Um, and then he came back um, about six years later after the injection and he said that he had pain worsening over the right hip um, very severe pain now in the right hip um, his bone turnover markers remained unchanged and the bone scintigraphy showed that the infusion that he had in 2009 or 11 was still working really well but he had pain in the in the bone so we did do 
um, a, f a f MRI scan to exclude any complications. The MRI scan showed no abnormality in the pelvic bones apart from the previously diagnosed Paget's disease, but he had severe degenerative changes in the, in the hip. So his pain was coming from the hip, um, and he had a hip replacement, um, and actually I saw him earlier this year and he was still telling me that everything is perfect. And if you look at his bone markers, his bone markers remained very stable. There was a little bit of a glitch in bone markers around the time of the hip replacement, which is normal because if you have a hip replacement, usually if you recover afterwards, you get a slight increase immediately after. Um, and the CTX, which is a marker of bone resorption, that had increased a little bit after, but that stayed stable. And actually, it stayed stable now for, uh, for the last three or four years since he had the hip replacement with no pain whatsoever. So there would be very unusual if we could see you in clinic and we say that I know what the cause of that pain is in a hip. We need to determine what happens with the Paget's disease. If the Paget's is active, tre treat the Paget's disease, wait for it to settle down, and then only would we be able to say it's not the Paget's disease, it's the hip. Um, Fortunately, the orthopedic surgeons would not operate that gentleman until we've treated the Paget's disease, so that might clear the symptoms, and you don't need a hip replacement as yet if the symptoms clear. But like I say, it's, it's a, a matter of don't rush in, because if you rush in, you might run into problems, and so we might refer the patient for the hip replacement, and the hip replacement might not cure the pain because it might be Paget's disease, but there's no clear way of telling that. Um, so the question is, why don't we just treat everybody irrespective? Why don't we just give everybody a, a, an infusion of, of zolivinate? Because we don't have all the evidence to that yet, because it's, it's not very cheap, but there are side effects of this medication. And I've just listed a few um, side effects. So we don't use oral bisphosphonates very often. We use oral bisphosphonates if we have concern about um, reactions to the intravenous infusion or if we have concerns about kidney function then we might use the oral tablets. It's um, a pain to take. I, I'm sure some of you have taken the tablets in the past. It's not very pleasant to take. You have to take it on an empty stomach with a large cup of water. Sit upright for uh, at least half an hour after the tablet. You can't get back in bed, you could go and do some gardening, but if you decide to take it with a coffee or a latte, then it doesn't work at all. So um, you have to um, take it specifically every day, and we used to give it a dose of 30 milligrams of rosedronate every day for two months. So for two months, your early morning life is on hold due to the fact that it's very difficult to take the tablets. Um, and, and that could cause heartburn and, and um, bloating and vomiting and nausea. And uh, 20 to 30 percent of patients in surveys have reported those side effects. And we know that you have to stop that if you get heartburn or if there's difficulty in swallowing. So the oral bisphosphonates, we still have patients, and I have patients in this room that has taken oral bisphosphonates. Um, but we give it to them for a good reason, either because we're concerned about extension of insufficiency fractures, we're concerned about kidney function, or they um, have contraindications to the intravenous uh, zoledronate due to kidney um, impairment or chronic kidney disease. Um, so as I've said, that's the most common side effects of the oral bisphosphonate. So um, the next step would be intravenous bisphosphonate. So if we look at intravenous bisphosphonate, um, that's very convenient. We have a very, an excellent nursing team who's very efficient at getting intravenous bisphosphonates and we infuse on a Monday uh, between six and sometimes up to ten infusions in a Monday afternoon. So they're really efficient at giving intravenous infusions. It is not very expensive, it's very cost effective to do, but again it can cause an acute phase response, so it can cause flu-like symptoms if you have a, a, a zoledronate for the first time. And we warn patients about the flu-like symptoms, it's about 20%. Now, what zoledronate does, the moment you infuse it into the artery, it circulates through the blood and it goes and sits on your bone. So it's like armor onto the bone. But unfortunately, it doesn't only sit in the Paget's disease, it'll sit all over all bones. So it covers all your bones. It covers the Paget's bone more acutely due to the fact that blood supply in the Paget's bone is more. So there's more blood circulating there. 
But when it sits onto the bone, the osteoclasts, which are those cells that dig out bone, try to overcome the effect of the zoledronate within three or four hours, and those osteoclasts start secreting their nasty enzymes and hydrogen peroxide. We used to dye our hair with peroxide when I was 16 years old because we wanted to look like a surfer. And um, so, so all these nasty chemicals get released into the blood and that can cause flu-like symptoms. And it's important to try and wash out the chemicals by taking lots of coffee and lots of juice and water over the next couple of days to ensure that the kidneys are protected and the kidney and the chemicals wash out. Other side effects is uh, muscle pains, stomach pains, um, uh, tiredness and flu-like symptoms. So about 40% of patients might have side effects on intravenous oledronate. So that probably explains why we don't want to give it to everybody, um, even though it is not very um, expensive to give the drug. So, so we do decide, along with the patient, what we would advocate is the best treatment for, for um, in certain cases. So other causes that bisphosphonates as a group can cause is inflammation of the eye. Fortunately, it's very rare. We don't see that often. But it does cause us a headache because we have patients with Paget's disease who had um, bisphosphonate treatment with tablets and they had very s severe iritis that needed steroid treatment. And the question is then how do you treat them if they need further treatment in future? Do you give them infusion again or, or how, what do you dare giving infusion to prevent future infect, um, uh, inflammation in the eye? And then the kidney effects. So it can be nephrotoxic, especially if you have had kidney damage in the past. So in that sense, we don't use the infusion if the filtration rate in the kidney is less than 35. Um, and we would uh, consider oral treatment. And then I've put the question mark, question mark, uh, um, denosumab anecdotally. Now, there is a lot of cases um, from colleagues in the Padgett's Association that has used denosumab, but we can't advocate it because we don't have any evidence for denosumab. Now, denosumab is a drug that we use for, for osteoporosis treatment, um, and it would work for Paget's disease, but it is not, as far as we can understand, it doesn't have longevity when, it, when you treat um, Paget's disease. And other side effects of the bisphosphonates is then hypocalcemia. It can cause some palpitations and arrhythmias, and then the most scary side effects that those of you who's received bisphosphonates may come across is uh, bisphosphonate associated on osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical fractures where you have fractures in unusual areas, so in the shaft of the femur rather than in the hip, those sort of things. Fortunately, both of those are exceedingly rare. Um, bisphosphonate associated osteonecrosis of the jaw is where a teeth is extracted and it doesn't heal very rapidly. Um, it's been described more in oncology patients, still very rare, but oncology patients are more likely to suffer it. So those are patients say, that has had breast cancer and for treatment of their breast cancer they have received the zoledronate infusions, but they receive the zoledronate infusions sometimes three weekly or four weekly. So they might uh, receive ten times the dose of um, the drug that we infuse in the Paget's clinic. Um, but it is something to be aware of and that we do advise patients with good dental hygiene and also if they have pain to contact us, so if they have pain in the femur with regards to um, atypical fractures to contact us so that we can exclude that. Um, I'm going to mention denosumab um, and I don't want you to go back to your local clinics and say could we have denosumab please because it's not licensed for Paget's disease. Um, and there's no hard evidence for the use of, um, of denosumab. There are some studies that um, is being done on the use of denosumab in Paget's disease. Um, I have to put my hands up and say I have one patient who's received denosumab in Paget's disease, but unfortunate or fortunate, the patient did have osteoporosis as well. Um, she had severe renal impairment. I could only give a treatment for the osteoporosis by treating the osteoporosis with denosumab and a Paget's disease has responded really well to the denosumab. So it's, it's not licensed for use in denosumab but she was fortunate in that she 
had severe osteoporosis along with Paget's disease. She had other disease where she needed steroids at high dose in the past and that caused osteoporosis. So it was almost like buy one, get one free in her case. And so she was very fortunate. But, in, and that's where the anecdotes come in. There's no evidence that we have hard evidence in any randomized trials that would suggest that denosumab is um, effective. And this patient would swear by the denosumab that she's on, and she's been on it for nearly four and a half years now, and her Paget's disease is under control, but we didn't use it for the Paget's disease. It was almost that when we knew that she had osteoporosis, I breathed a sigh of relief and said, now I can give her some denosumab injections. But it's still, um, the jury is out on denosumab. So what does the future hold for us? How do we manage patients in the future? Do we get improved bisphosphonates? Do we really need improved bisphosphonates? Because if you improve a bisphosphonate, that means that the stickiness of the drug, and that's the improvement that we've had over years, that drug sticks onto the bone for longer. And would that really be of benefit? Perhaps in the Paget's disease it would be in benefit, but for the rest of the bone, for risk of side effects like osteonecrosis of the jaw or atypical fractures in the hip, it might not be of um, severe benefit. So, so bisphosphonates, I personally don't think we need anything better unless we can devise a bisphosphonate that does not cause the bone to shut down completely um, in, in some areas. Um, the, we have um, the ZIP study, Prof. Ralston mentioned the ZIP study, was looking at prevention of Paget's disease, so there's, that's detecting patients with genetic susceptibility to Paget's disease and treating those patients. And then the denosumab. Denosumab differs from zoledronate in that it only lasts, the injection only lasts for about six months. But we do not know, once the studies have been done, is one shot of denosumab, one injection of denosumab, enough to switch off the cells and keep them switched off for years? I have patients who had zoledronate in 2003, so there's some of the patients were treated in 2003 with one infusion of zoledronate and the passage to disease activity has not recurred over 16 years. So could denosumab do the same? We know that denosumab, the effect of denosumab is short-lived, short only about six months, but it might be that in some patients it would work. It would be quite helpful because we know it's safe in kidney failure, so if you've got really bad kidney function, we could use that. And then is there an option for genetic modulation for those patients with genetic um, uh, um, sort of undertones or genetic preponderance or pre predisposition to Paget's disease? And um, I'm no expert on that. Rob might be able to tell us whether he thinks, looking back at the history of Paget's disease, whether the future might hold some genetic modulation for Paget's disease. So I'm getting back to that x-ray. And I'm still in argument with myself. If I see an x-ray of that for the first time, and the patient comes in and he complains of pain on the tibia, and he's um, bisphosphonate naive, how would I treat him? I'd definitely put him in a cast to avoid that fracture from extending. I might consider if there's a huge amount of activity, once the, the, the um, fracture is healed after two or three months, consider giving him oral bisphosphonates to be on the safe side. You could give him intravenous bisphosphonates, but this particular patient already had three or four doses of permidronate. So this patient's Paget's disease was dormant, was in remission, and he had extension of uh, insufficiency fracture, so he just got a cast. But if he came to somebody that maybe didn't, was not in the know, complained of pain, they said, it's Paget's disease, let's give you a further infusion, who knows, that extension fracture might extend, the insufficiency fracture might extend. But we don't know because we don't have the evidence on that, unfortunately. There's just not enough evidence for that. Um, I'll leave you at that. Thank you.